right? So we're going to do our best this morning to dig as deep as we can to understand, again, there's some things we're not going to understand, and that's when, that's when you go into your own personal studies to dig deeper, okay? So we're just hitting the highlights this morning. So you remember in our previous lessons, we have learned about the history of the church along with its spiritual conditions, conditions throughout the ages. We have also looked into the importance of being sealed before the angels let go of the four winds of strife. The question all of us have probably wondered numerous times deals with the fifth seal, which poses the, the question, how long, O oh Lord? Remember, in the fifth seal, the, you know, the saints who were martyred for their faith, the blood of them cried from the ground, which indicated how long, O oh Lord, until you avenge us of, of what we're going through in this world. How long? Will all this evil in the world take place? How long until you cleanse this earth of sin? The good news is God knows exactly what we are going through. Amen. He knows exactly. Every single individual, every one that is his, he knows exactly what's going on. His plea to us, though, is to watch, to be patient, to, and to be diligent. He says, I'm coming soon. So the vision of the seven trumpets, which we're going to be getting into here, shows that throughout history, God already has intervened on behalf of his oppressed people and has judged those who harm them. The purpose of the seven trumpets is to assure God's people that heaven is not indifferent to their suffering. So God knows exactly what we're going through. All right. So let's look at Sunday's lesson, the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints. Hold, hold it. Hold. Oh, I want to say different vernacular, but I put it into earthly terms. God is saying, "I know I've been there." Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah, he's been there. So the prayer of the saints. Let's uh, let's read. Revelation chapter 8, we're going to look at verses 3 to 5. Revelation 8, starting at verse 3, and you get there, say amen. Still hear some pages turning there. <laughs> All right, here we go. Revelation 8, starting at verse 3. Uh huh. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was giving unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Verse 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it down cast it to the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake all right so we have an altar we have a golden censer we have incense let me ask you a question where in the bible do we first hear about these particular items where in the bible do we first hear about these particular items anyone the old testament the earthly sanctuary, you remember? The incense, the sanctuary, right? So in order to, I encourage you, in order to understand a lot of revelation, you got to understand the, the, that sanctuary back in Leviticus and, you know, how Moses formed it in Exodus, right? God was given, God gave him specific dimensions on how to build the earthly sanctuary. And why did he build it? Exodus 25, 8. Let them build me a sanctuary that what? I may what? Dwell among them, Okay. It shows the plan. You said the plan of salvation. Yeah, the plan okay. of salvation and his ministry. What he was showing, what God Jesus was going to do. He was pointing to his ministry and, of course, uh, his ultimate sacrifice. That's right. That's right. So, in the sanctuary, yes, it, you see the the whole entire plan of salvation working out. Okay. In the holy place, which was what? The first compartment of the sanctuary, 
we have the altar of incense which burned continually okay what does this represent let me let me get let me get her back here brother yeah Repre the incense represents the prayers of of prayers god people that is right so the incense is the prayer of god's people that's what it represents all right and it rep you know those that are alive and dead every saint that has ever lived remember every saint that has ever lived the prayers of the saints okay remember the fifth seal where the blood of blood of those cried out from the ground okay not literally but god knows who's his even those who died in faith in him so now we have the trumpets that are introduced as well coming up um, again we need to understand the sanctuary to understand what we're about to, to get into here so before we get into the meaning we're not going to get into the meaning of trumpets right now but when you when you hear trumpets what do you what comes to mind when you hear trumpets what what does it represent Announcements, proclamations, um, they sounded off at the beginning of battles, and uh, it was just frightening that enemy there. But uh, it was mainly proclamations, and uh, okay, okay. so in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the trumpets were sound before usually before war right something was about to happen so in the book of revelation what's the meaning of the trumpets if it was it was it was indicative of the war and everything in the old testament what about the what is going on in revelation we know it's the last book of the bible it, it is a revealing so the trumpets here represent judgment judgment the Lord says, vengeance is mine. First, First Thessalonians 4.16 talks about when God's, when Christ comes back, it talks about the trump of God. Okay? So there's something happening, which is judgment. What is this idea of fire cast to the ground? What does fire do? It consumes. What does fire do? Hold on. What did you say, brother? It's kind of cleansing. It fire, fire cleanses. So the angel gets the fire from the altar, throws it to the ground, which represents what? The ground, the earth. You see? You see the correlation? All right. Have there been times in history where God's judgment has played out in this world? Already? What's an example? Sodom and Gomorrah. What else? The flood. Anything else that we've that we've seen? Maybe it was God doing the act. Anything else? So God is do you believe God is a God of justice and judgment? He's both. He's both. And that's where the love is, okay? That's where he, that's where his unconditional love is. He's, ju he's a just God. What happens if, hold on, hold, hold that thought, brother. What happens if sin continues to play out in this world? What would happen? And there's no judgment at all. What was that? Say that one more time. This world is set for self-destruction. And we would destroy ourselves. I mean, I can't prove it, but I believe if things just kept going, that's what we do. We we destroy ourselves. It's not nuclear war. Um, I mean, a lot of people want to believe in the Star Trek view of it, but uh, you never know. I don't. I don't see that. I like to see that, but uh, when Satan and 
you let Satan be in charge, it, it, it's human, that's his goal, is for us to self-destruct. So, yep, if sin continued to play out, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be good at all. Call it spiritual anarchy. If we didn't have laws in this land and people were, were able to run and do what they wanted to do, call it anarchy. There's no laws. If there's no laws, there's no justice, there's no judgment. So it would be chaos. So God, in his love, he has to eradicate sin. He has to. So let's look at the meaning of the trumpets. Let's look at Revelation 8. Revelation 8, verse, starting in verse 13. Revelation 8, starting in verse 18. And I'm going to come around and let someone else read. Revelation 8, 13. Honey, can you get that for us? Okay. Revelations 8, 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the mist of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which, which are yet to sound. Thank you. So when there is, a, when there is pronounced a woe, that is warning. Get ready, right? Or woe. Turn to Revelation 9, verse 4. And we're also going to read verses 20 and 21. Revelation 9, verse 4. And who has that? Anyone has it? You want to read that, Victoria? And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. You want 20 and 21? And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. Neither repented they that their murders, nor their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thief, th thefts. All right, thank you. So you read that, and you're like, what are they talking about? <laughs> All right. So, if the seals represent... The history of God's professed people, professed church, what does the trumpet represent? We, we talked about God's judgment against those who have rejected him and caused his saints havoc upon the earth. Right. Oh, definitely. You're right. You're right. Let me ask you a question. to announce the beginning that's right is god is god's love shown even in his final judgment when his for, forbearance runs out so there is a forbearance to god's love his long suffering is god's love still in that when he when fire comes down how is that explain that to me because you may get someone and say I, I don't understand how's god's love shown in hellfire in judgment so to speak Anyone? I believe at the final judgment, um, he will be able to show everyone their works. And they will be able to let, you know, he will be able to say, you know, they will be able to say to him, you are just. You know, everything that you're doing is just and fair. So basically, I deserve what I'm about to get. Final judgment, when I think of the final judgment, it's like somebody telling me, it's up, this is it. It's now or never. If you're not good, you ain't got no more chances. Okay. All right. Why don't you think of it like, think of it like this. You guys have kids, right? Okay. 
Now, you raise your kid to the best of your abilities, and uh, this kid grows up, and this kid grows up, and for some reason or not, they start, they, they hate you. They hate you. They hate you to, to pieces. And uh, they living in your home. And they're not following the rules. You tell them what to do. They're, they they shun you. They do all this thing over and over. You give them grace over and over. This goes over for, let's say, 10 years, okay? Have it. You're, you're stressed out. What do you do? You let that kid stay there? They're grown. They're 18. You let them stay there? What do you do? You let them? Uh-huh. Right. Now it's time for you to put it into practice. Well, we let, well, for me, I'll let the kid, the, the kid's got to go, okay? <laughs> the kids. Mm-hmm. Well, the kids got the kids got to go. So that's judgment in our in our sense, right? Well, God loves us so much that He's not going to let us. Here's the deal. All this stuff that's happening in the world has to play out. God knows exactly what's going on. He's in control, okay? But in the end, the enemy has to the, the world has to see the the works of Satan. They have to see all the havoc he's caused. And that's going to justify who God really is. Does that make, does that make sense? All right. Let's, let's move on. So I'm going to go through these a little, little swiftly here because of time. What are the meaning of the trumpets as pertaining to history? Okay. The first two trumpets, and you can look these up, give you some verses and everything. The first two trumpets, judgment against God's professed people who rejected and crucified Christ. Okay, we're talking about the Jer in Jerusalem and the Roman Empire. You can look up Jeremiah 11, verses 16 and 17, Matthew 23, verses 27 and 30. Uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 23, verses 37 and 38, and look at J Jeremiah 51, 24 and 25. Okay, judgment starts at the house of God. You can read in Ezekiel 8 and 9 how that happens. Okay, judgment always starts with the house of God. So the first two trumpets deals with judgment against God's professed people who eventually crucified our Lord, okay? Trumpets 3 and 4, the Bible speaks of an angel of light as it were falling from heaven, okay? Who is this angel of light falling from heaven? It's Satan. Satan, okay? And um, as you read this, Water represents life and growth. Here we see the judgment on, on the apostasy of the church, okay? Now we're going through the time of history. This is the third and fourth trumpet. Again, I, I encourage you to do, to read this, study it out for yourself so you can understand everything, okay? So we, we just, again, we have to hit the, the highlights here. The apostasy of the church through deception, church and state combining, Okay? You're going, to see, you're going to hear some similarities of the seals, too, along with the trumpets. The fifth and sixth trump, uh, trumpet is God's judgment on religious apostasy and secular, secularism. Okay? At this point, God's truth is totally eclipsed. Totally eclipsed. The only safety here is full truth in God that he will save his faithful ones from the powers of darkness. So at this, this fifth and sixth trumpet, we know that if, if, the, if the Bible is eclipsed, I mean, it's, there is no word of God, okay? The, the word of God has been trampled underfoot, and we know what ha what's happening. A lot of what? Persecution. A lot of killing. A lot of bloodshed, okay? So judgment on these folks who cause this, Okay? Let me read this to you. <clears throat> this is on, on Monday's lesson. Uh, right in the middle, kind of in the middle, second paragraph starts with the seven trumpets. The seven trumpets cover the course of events from John's time until the conclusion of Earth's history. They are blown, they are blown while intercession goes on in heaven. 
and the gospel is being preached on the earth. Okay? Check out C. The fifth and sixth trumpets describe the warning, the warring factions in the religious world during the late medieval and post-reformation periods. These periods are characterized by increasing demonic activity that ultimately draws the world into battle, the battle of Armageddon. So let me ask you this. Does history repeat itself? Is history going to repeat itself? <laughs> okay. Um, it, we're already experiencing it, folks. Um, we're already experiencing, experiencing history again. The angel with the open book. Let's look at Revelation chapter 10. I'm going to have someone else read here. We're going to look at Revelation 10 verses 1 through 4. Brother John, can you get that for us, brother? Revelation 10, 1 through 4. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the, which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. All right, amen. Thank you, brother. So we have an angel here, a beautiful image. Question for you. Who is this angel that came down from heaven? Who is this angel? We have some clues. We have some clues. Okay. Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Well, it said he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. What does that represent? That represents dominion. I have, I am in control. I created this world. Dominion. Rainbow. What does rainbow represent? That's a promise. That's right. And God gave that promise. So that is none other than Jesus Christ, folks. Huh? That, that he wouldn't destroy the earth again by a flood. Right. Well, I didn't hear you. Let me, let me come back here. Uh, bountiful and uh, be a blessing and so that he um, would bless the earth while we were on it and not to send the flood, great floods again because they're wiped out. An, an example of what was left the remnants of human creation other than the whole entire uh, human uh, uh, genocide, genocide. You're right. oh, oh, hold that thought, bro. We just got to, we got to move. We got to move forward. We, we, time is ticking. But hold your thought. We'll get to you. All right. Revelation chapter 10, we're going to look at uh, a few more verses here. Revelation 10, verses 5 through 7. Let's look at that real quickly. Revelation 10, verse 5. And the angel which I saw. Oh, you got it, brother. I'm sorry. 10, starting at verse 5. Revelation 5, 6, and 7, 10. Chapter, no, no, no. chapter 10, verse 5, 6, and, verse 5, 6, and 7. And may the Lord add a blessing to his reading of his word. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever. Who created heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it that there will be delay no longer. Verse 7, Revelation 10, verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. Amen. Thank you, brother. 
All right, so it talks about in these verses time no longer. What does that indicate? What does this mean? Well, we know this is a period of time. What book in the Bible talks about a period of prophetic time? In what book? The book of Daniel. Book of Daniel, book of Revelation, they go together like hand and glove, folks. And there was two time periods. Two time periods. It talks about in Daniel chapter 12, we read about a time times time and half a time you break that down and you study that that is 1260 days in prophetic time that is 1260 years what happened during the 1260 years which was started at AD 538 all the way to 1798 what happened during that period what do you say what was that the cleansing of the temple all oh. That's the 2300 day prophecy. Uh, the papal persecution. Papal persecution. This is the time also where God's word was. See, here's the deal. During that time, especially in Constantine's time, the word of God was, they kept it away. They didn't want people to read the word. Why? Because they didn't want them to know the truth of what God wanted them to know. This was a dark time, 1260 prophetic years. And what other, pro what other prophecy pertains to time no longer? There's another prophecy in Daniel. You said it earlier. The 2300-day prophecy. It does coincide with the dark. Well, this actually, 2300, the 1260 coincides with the with the uh, the dark ages the 2300 day prophecy which is also 2300 years which goes from 457 BC all the way to 1844 what happened in that in that time period there was a great what disappointment why was why was there a great disappointment They thought Jesus was coming back in that time period. Exactly right. And what happened in that? What happened, biblically, what happened? Jesus moved from what? This goes back to the Old Testament now. He moved from the holy place to what? The most holy place. And what happened? And then, which indicates judgment has come. Okay? In the most holy place, we have the Ark of the Covenant. What's inside the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments on the side of the Ark of the Covenant is what? Moses' book. Okay, that's what's happening. Let me read this to you. This time, this is at the bottom of the page on Tuesday. This time, which the angel de de declares with a solemn oath, is prophetic time, which should precede the advent of our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn, to the autumn of 1844, like we just read. So let's look at eating the scroll. Revelation 10, 8 through 11. Who can read that for me? Revelation 10, verses 8 through 11. Uh-huh. The voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make and it shall make thy belly bitter thy, thy belly bitter, but it shall be in but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Right. Amen. Thank you. All right. The little book, the, eating the scroll. Eating the scroll. So what is this little book the angel's holding? 
let's take a glimpse at the bittersweet experience. You've heard that term before, it's bittersweet, right? So what makes receiving, well, what is this, what is this scroll? Let me just add, tell you that, I mean, ask that. What is the scroll? What's that, brother? It's the sec it's a little book in the book of Daniel that, that pertains to the time. Yes. Uh, that talks about the eighteen forty four. That's exactly right. So it's the little book. And remember, <clears throat> there was a time where John John wants that book. He wants to know. There was a time where John wept because he wanted to know. And there was a time where Daniel fainted because he didn't know. <laughs> okay. So it, it's bittersweet. And let me, let, me, let me break this down to you here. When we truly search the scriptures and ask the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth, it's a sweet ordeal. Is it sweet to you? When you find truth, okay? However, when conviction sets in and we are called to go contrary to our comfort zones, it can be bitter. Bitter sweet. See that? Okay. <laughs> all right. John's, hold on one second, brother. I'll get to you. John's bittersweet experience in eating the scroll, representing the book of Daniel, is related to the unsealing of Daniel's end time prophecy. Okay, 2300 days, 1260 day prophecy. John here represents God's end time remnant church that is commissioned to proclaim the everlasting gospel at the close of Daniel's time prophecy. The, the angel also said in these verses we read that John needed to prophesy again. Okay, what does this mean? That he needed to prophesy again. It was, a, it was a verse 11. Prophesy again. What does that mean? Because he ate the book, it was bitter to him. In other words, uh, it, the eating of the book, that was the the Millerite movement, the message that they were preaching was a sweet message, that Christ was coming, they were very glad, it was sweet like honey. But when the disappointment came, then, that, then it was bitter. Right. Yeah, the, it was a bitter disappointment. But then he was told that he, they must prophesy again, and that's where the remnant come in. Yes. We now have to what? Give the same message. Amen. But with the added word. We have to now let them know about the sanctuary, what is taking place in heaven. Exactly right. Exactly right. Prophesy again. You guys got it wrong the first time. I didn't come back. So I need you to prophesy again and let my people know what, what's really going on. That's pretty much what's, what's, what, what, what Jesus is saying here. What was that, brother? He wants us to know everything. He, he doesn't want any excuses for Well, he didn't tell us about that. You know, it's like, man, I'm being vague here maybe, but uh, God wants the whole plan spelled out in succession, you might say. And we have no, no reason to be able to say, that we didn't know certain certain things. Because we got we got everything we need in the Word of God, right? Everything we need in there. Just believing it, trusting in His Word, leaning on Him. All right. Revelation. Briefly look at Revelation chapter eleven, verses one and two. Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2. We're going to look at this briefly. It says here, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Verse 2, But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. 40 and 2 months. So this idea of measuring God's temple or measuring the altar, what does that mean? What does that mean? It also means judgment. Okay, to take place at the house of God. We talked about previously 
You can read in Ezekiel. That whole Ezekiel chapter and chapter 9 is chapter 8 was the abominations of the, the, the children of God. Chapter 9 Ezekiel was the judgments. It talks about go and seal my people first before this judgment happens to my people here. Okay? So you can read in that. So it's a measure and it's a judgment. If you configure, and it said 42 months. If you do the math on the 42 months, that comes out to what? 1260 days or 1260 years once again, okay? Which represented the persecution of doing the, uh, the papacy, okay? Revelation 11.1 1 refers to the judgment that takes place prior to the second coming. This judgment concerns exclusively God's people, the worshipers in the temple, okay? So the judgment of God, folks, like we, like we said before, it's good news. It, it's good news. You know, there, there, you know, people in this world, and even me, when I was a, you know, baby coming into the faith, uh, Christianity, I thought God was a, a tyrant. I didn't, you know, judging? Why you got to judge me? But, but there is a misconception of God, who, who he really is. And but the Bible says he is God. God is love and judgment and justice is his proclamation of love. Let's look at. Uh, hold, hold that thought, brother. We on, let's 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 uh, look at this last lesson here on Thursday. Hold your thought, though. What you got? The two witnesses. The two witnesses. Revelation 11 verses three through six. Revelation 11 verses three through six. Anyone have that? Revelation 11 verses three through six. I'll read it. <laughs> you got it? Mm -hmm. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt, will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must, he must in this manner be killed. These have, these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. All right. Amen. So, you know, what my next, you know, my question is going to be right. Who are these witnesses? We have some clues here. They. Here on earth, I mean, uh, okay, that's witnesses from Jesus, it's from heaven, it's Jesus Christ, and uh, well, it's the Holy Spirit, uh, this, if that's what you're talking about, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Well, let's look at it, let's look at it, we got some clues here, they prophesied for 1260 years, there's that number again, we know what happened in that time period, they're clothed with sackcloth, what does sackcloth represent? In the Bible, remember in the Old Testament, lots of sackcloth was happening. More a time of mourning. Sackcloth and prayer, two candlesticks. Remember in Revelation one, what does candlesticks represent? The church, olive tree. What comes out of the olive tree? All right. So when you study this out, and again, I implore you, encourage you to study this. The two witnesses, the old in the New Testament, which represents who is the Word of God? Jesus Christ. Revelation, I mean, John chapter 1, you can read that. The Word became flesh. So the Old and the, two test, and the, old and the New Testament. Let me read this to you. This comes from Spirit of Prophecy, volume 4, page 188, says, the two witnesses represent the Old and New Testament scriptures. Both are important testimonies to the origin and perpetuity of the law of God. 
Both are witnesses also to the plan of salvation. The types, the sacrifices, and prophecies of Old Testament point to the Savior to come. The gospel and epistles of the New Testament tell a, of, a saviors, of a Savior who has come in the exact manner foretold by type and prophecy. So who is this beast that kills the two witnesses? What is so... It's Satan, you're right. Let me, let me bring it to you like this. Satan's plan, what is his, what is his ultimate plan? What is Satan's ultimate plan? To destroy us. But how does, he, how does he do it? What is his one number one way to try to destroy us? Deception and confusion. <clears throat> so if he, can, if he can get you to not believe in the word of God, he got you. If he can get you to believe something in the word of God that doesn't, and you read something in the Old Testament and say, oh, I read this in the New Testament, but I don't believe that. I'm an Old Testament Christian. I'm a New Testament Christian. Right? That is that is not how that uh, Right. Uh-huh. Truth truth and deception. But actually deception and confusion is what he uses to 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 destroy us. Right. All right. So to study this out, folks. You're going to come to anybody familiar with the French Revolution? Okay. French Revolution, particular the massacre at St. Bartholomew. You ever heard of that before? Okay. Um, I want you to think about the you know when all the christians were slaughtered for their faith in the dark ages this massacre the french revolution was a lot of that going on as well a lot of killing because of god's word god's word during this time the french revolution was trampled to the ground it looked like satan was winning does it feel like satan's winning now in this world it may look like it it feels like it don't it but look, we have this great hope. But Jesus says what? Do not fear them that kills the body, but what? But kills the soul. Fear him. This life is passing. And um, the Lord knows who's his. The Lord knows who's his. Paul said to live as Christ to what? And to what? To die is, is gain. So who care? You kill me? So what? My, my, my faith is in Jesus Christ. My faith is in Jesus Christ. Listen to this. We're in closing. God has always had a remnant. True followers, even in troublous times in her earth's history. The reason we have the word of God now, even though in the French Revolution, in all the times of the trumpets where God's word seemed that it was dimming, there were still a remnant of people who kept God's word alive. Amen? And it is because we are here today of that fact. Now listen to this. Where his word seemed void, there through Satan's devices, history bound, history is bound to repeat itself. In the book of Proverbs, it talks about wisdom, how she cries upon the housetops for men and women to sup with her okay the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom he is our only defense our refuge and our strength in, in ever in ever present okay and here's the proclamation earnestly pray for and seek revival and reformation by the power of the holy spirit I'm going to close with this verse, Revelation 22, verses 12 through 14. You can turn there with me. Revelation 22, starting at verse 12. Revelation 22, starting at verse 12. Jesus says, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward 
is with me to every man according as his work shall be verse 13 i am the alpha and omega the beginning and the end the first and the last verse 14 blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city so my encouragement to you brothers and sisters is to hold on a little longer don't faint pray without ceasing and I believe the Lord will deliver us amen let's pray amen. our Father in heaven we thank you Lord for your words for your powerful words Lord thank you Lord for revealing us to us what is happening or what has happened in history so that we can get ready to meet Jesus in the air without being ashamed. Lord, we ask that you will please create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. This is the only way. It looks like the enemy is in control, but you are in control, Lord. Help us, Lord, to lean completely on you without wavering. And we thank you, Lord. We ask for a blessing um, today, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you will hide the speaker behind your cross, uh, that you will pour out your love to us, Lord. Help us to be an example, Lord, of Christ living in us. In Jesus' name, amen.